All right, guys, so the next big step in the shop renovation is gonna be doing all of the electrical work. As you guys might remember, I basically gutted the electrical here in the shop area. The previous owner had done some stuff to the wiring that made it really hard to identify which circuits went where, and so I decided to just kind of start from scratch since I didn't have any outlets where I wanted them anyway, and you know, a lot of my power tools require specific amperages, and so it seemed to make more sense just to kind of start fresh. So this is gonna be the main panel for this shop area. I actually have a total of four panels here at the shop. I've got our main panel, which is a 400 amp service. I've got three phase here in this building. And then I have one sub panel right next to the main panel on the other side of this wall. And then we've got these two sub panels. Again, this one will power pretty much everything in the shop. And this one powers everything in the living space as well as some of the stuff in the attic. So because this building's so old, I think they basically just continued adding on over time. So it's been a bit of a challenge to kind of figure out exactly what was what but I think I have a pretty good handle on it. And so now I can finally get started wiring the shop, which is really exciting because this whole time uh, building out all of the stuff in here, I've been working off of two outlets. So as I mentioned, I do have three phase power here in this building and this is a three phase panel. And so as you can see, there are three hots coming in two that are your kind of standard 120 like you would have at a residence. But then this orange one is what's called a high leg. And that's the one I need to watch out for here because if I go put in any 240 volt break for any of my larger power tools and that kind of thing, it's not gonna matter where I put in this panel. But the thing I need to pay attention to is when I put in my 120 volt circuits because there are five spots in this panel that connect to that high leg. And if I were to put a 120 volt breaker on that high leg, it would be getting about 208 volts of power. And as you can imagine, that would be a big problem. And I'd actually considered swapping this whole panel just to help avoid this, but honestly, I think it should be pretty simple to keep it straight. And even though this panel is older, there's really nothing wrong with it. So it seemed kind of like a waste of time and money to replace it. Now, there are a few things I do want to address. Uh, one, as you can see here, the grounds and neutrals are terminated together, which in a sub panel, that should not ever happen. You should be splitting up your grounds and neutrals. Your ground should be connected to a bar that connects to the panel so that in the event of a fault, that ground current can make its way back to the main panel safely. As you can see, that's not the case in this panel, but that's easy enough. I can just drill and tap holes and attach a ground bus bar and that'll take care of that. The one other thing is there is no dedicated ground wire going back to the main panel. And that's because this metal conduit here acts as the ground path. And that used to be acceptable by code, but things have changed and I need to run a dedicated ground wire, which should be pretty easy. It's only about 10 feet back to the main panel. And once I do that, I can connect it to that ground bar and we will be good to go. So with all that worked out, I can start running some circuits and let's head over to the area where I'll be installing my first circuit. So this is the wall where I'm gonna be starting my electrical work. I need to paint this wall, obviously, and I figured I could go ahead and use up some of the old conduit that I had salvaged when I pulled out all of the old electrical because it's a little dingy and dirty looking. So I figured I'll go ahead and install this conduit prior to painting. I can paint it and make it look nice and tidy. So this building is technically zoned mixed use, but I'm treating everything in here as commercial. And so I'm gonna be using a lot of more commercial grade materials for my outlet boxes. I'm gonna be using these 1900 boxes. They're four inches by four inches. They have a pretty good depth and that's gonna allow me to fit things like GFCI outlets. I am gonna go ahead and GFCI protect all of the 120 volt outlets here. That is the 2020 National Electric Code requirement. This I think would be viewed as a garage space. We are still on the 2017 National Electric Code here in Asheville, but I figure I can go ahead and do that easily enough. I'm not gonna do it yet on the 240 volt circuits because I don't know if you guys have seen the prices on the GFCI 240 volt breakers, but it's unbelievable. They are like 10 times plus the cost of a standard breaker. So I'm gonna wait until that's absolutely required, but I figured it's easy enough to go ahead and GFCI protect all of the 120 volt outlets. To attach the outlets to the boxes, I am using these metal face plates and I was actually able to pull these outlets out from my old shop in this configuration already pre-wired. So that's gonna make this super, super simple because with 120 volt circuits, first of all, I like to do every outlet as a quad outlet because in a workshop, you can never have too many outlets. But then the other thing I'm gonna do is for each run of 120 volt circuits, I'm gonna run two individual circuits and I'm going to wire each circuit to every other outlet box. So that means every five feet, I will have a box on a different circuit. So if I'm running two tools that are fairly power hungry, let's say my router table and a dust collector, both 120 volt tools, I can plug a one into one outlet, 
one into the other box. And I know that I will be on two separate outlets so I won't be tripping breakers, which is such a pain. And that's how we set it up in my old shop. And I don't think I ever tripped a breaker there, which is pretty incredible. Now, since I'm running everything through EMT conduit, I'm using THH in wire, which is basically just single wires. In this case, they're stranded wires. But since I'm gonna be running two circuits through one set of conduit, to keep things from getting confusing, I went ahead and got a few different wire colors. For the first circuit, I'm gonna use black for my hot and white for my neutral. And then for the second circuit, I'm gonna use blue for my hot and gray for my neutral. That way, I will have no confusion of which wire goes to which circuit, and then I'll have one common ground wire running through all of them. Now, since I'm pretty new to all of this EMT conduit work, to get from the panel to the first box here, I'm gonna use MC cable, and that's gonna run up on the ceiling. Again, I'm putting in a drop ceiling in this space, so I can basically just screw the MC cable to the joist above to support it, and then I will run that to a junction box, which will go up above the drop ceiling, and then change over to EMT conduit, NTHHN, at that point and that should minimize the bending I have to do. And I wish I could have used Romex instead of MC cable there, but again, commercial space, I am not allowed to do that even above a drop ceiling. You can do that in a residential space though. And while using this combination of MC cable and EMT conduit and the junction boxes will minimize the bending I have to do, it's still not gonna totally eliminate the bending because I am gonna have to do some box offset bends. And let's take a look at how you bend one of those box offsets. So bending these box offsets is pretty simple. I went ahead and cut my piece of conduit to length. I did mount both of these boxes to the wall to figure out that length. Obviously, I'll have to take one down before putting in the conduit, but just wanted to double check that length measurement. But once I did that, I went ahead and marked out a couple lines and these are pretty standard when doing box offsets on half inch conduit. So I marked in two and a half inches from the end and then from there another two and a quarter inches. So four and three quarters of an inch from the end. So the angle I'm gonna be using is 10 degrees on the bend. And I have this bender here from Klein Tools that actually has a little angle guide built in. So that should make it super, super simple. But basically all I'm gonna do is take my conduit and I'm gonna slide it in here and line up my mark with the arrow on the bender. Every bender, no matter what brand, is gonna have these same kind of marks. And basically everything ahead of that mark is not going to be bent, so that's gonna be the straight section that connects to the box itself. So then from there, I'm just gonna put some pressure on it. I really wanna be pushing closer to the bender because if I were to push way back here, that's gonna create a bend in the entire piece, which is obviously not what I want. I want the bend to happen right here. So with that angle guide, it's super, super simple. So I just bend until it touches my little guide. And then I'm gonna push through and I'm gonna rotate the piece 180 degrees, lining up my next mark with that arrow again. And then I wanna sight down to make sure my bends are gonna be lined up because essentially I'm bending up and then back down to essentially just jog this piece up and get it to go into the box. So that looks pretty good. So let's just repeat. And there we go, that should be our box offset. And now let's go to the wall and check it out. All right, so that looks good. So all I need to do is repeat the same process on the other end. Oh. And the only thing to keep in mind here is I need to keep the angles lined up because obviously if I had one box offset in one direction and the other in the other direction, that wouldn't be very useful. All right, so that's our first section installed. And basically from here on down the wall, it's just gonna be more of the same. I'm gonna put two more sets of boxes and then I'll also need to run one more piece of conduit up to another junction box up near the ceiling. And that's what the MC cable coming from the panel will go into. So with the conduit and boxes installed, I could go ahead and start getting some of the rough wiring done. I went ahead and ran some of that MC cable from the panel back over to that first junction box. And if you're newer to electrical work and want to add some circuits to, let's say, your garage shop, I would highly recommend checking out MC cable. It is very easy to work with. The metal sheathing protects it so you can run it surface mounted so you can skip all of this conduit bending work and run MC cable instead. That said, I don't think it looks as good. That's why I'm mainly just using it up in the ceiling because it just makes my life easier since it's flexible and I can run it kind of wherever I want. I fastened the empty cable every couple of feet up to the joist and then where I terminated it into the junction box in the panel I use this dual MC cable clamp so that I can run two of the cables into one knockout and that just is going to save me some of my knockouts on my panel. 
After that, I went ahead and started running some of the THHN wire. And as you can see, I got this really cool little kind of dispenser, if you will, from Racketeers. And it allows me to have all five of my spools nicely organized and I can pull the wire off of it without it getting all tangled up. And I went ahead and ran it from the second junction box in the line of outlets here, since I'm gonna be running both wires from those GFCI outlets from the first box. And then I ran it up to the junction box at the ceiling so it can be connected to the MC cable. And this wire is really easy to feed, especially over these fairly short distances of only about five feet between boxes. I connected the MC cable to the THHN in the junction box with my new favorite electrical things, these Wago connectors. If you guys haven't heard of these, they replace wire nuts. And instead of having to do all of that twisting, which, you know, if you're doing a whole bunch of junction boxes over the course of a day, it can get really taxing on the hand. You just flip open the clips, feed the wire in and close the clip and you're good to go. I also got this really cool automatic wire stripper for this project and I can set the amount of sheathing to remove to match the amount that Wago recommends to make sure I have a really good connection on all of those connectors. And now that that's done, I can go ahead and start getting my GFCI outlets prepped for installation. And in case you've never done it before, fitting outlets into these kind of face plates for these metal junction boxes is a little bit different. You need to remove the included screws that would screw into your kind of standard plastic box, which is used in residential work. And then I needed to break off the excess tab so that the outlets would fit in the faceplate. To attach the outlets to the faceplate, I bought a big pack of 832 screws and nuts. And all of this adds up to a bit more work than installing an outlet in your standard plastic box, but it's super secure and I think it's gonna be great for this workshop environment. So with some of the wires run, I can go ahead and make up this first outlet box with the GFCIs. So in case you've never wired up a GFCI outlet, let's just go over it real quick because it's a little bit different than your standard outlet. So on a GFCI, you've got a line side and a load side because unlike a standard outlet, especially if you're using pigtails, all of the current for that circuit is gonna go through this outlet first so that in the event of a fault, it will turn itself off and obviously that keeps you safe. The line side is gonna be your hot coming in from your panel and so I went ahead and wired up my hot and neutral to that. And then the load side is gonna be going to the rest of the outlets in the circuit. And I went ahead and wired up my matching hot and neutral to that. The other big thing is all of these boxes need to be grounded. So I went ahead and added this pigtail connected directly to the box. These boxes have a little kind of bump on them so that you can screw the pigtail to it. And then I needed to connect the ground wire coming in and the ground wire going to the rest of the circuits to that, as well as the ground wires from the outlets themselves. And so I'm sure some of the electricians in the audience might be saying, well, I don't need this ground wire moving forward. And that's definitely true because this EMT conduit, as long as it's connected well, acts as the ground. So really from here on, I could have no ground wire and it wouldn't be an issue. For me, I like to have redundancy. It's not much more work to add one more wire. And in case any of these connections ever come loose or something corrodes, I will not have any way for the ground path to be interrupted from the outlet back to the panel. Once all that was done, I could go ahead and attach both outlets to the faceplate and then attach the faceplate to the box and I'm good to go here to move on to the next outlet. So after wiring up the GFCI outlets, I went ahead and roughed in the rest of the wiring in this line of outlets. And again, I'm running each of these hot and neutral wires to every other outlet. So in the outlet on the right here, I'm using the black and white wires. So the blue and gray wires pass right through uncut to the next box in line and so on and so forth from there. And as I was getting to the end of the line, I started thinking it might be nice to have outlets further on down this wall, but I was going to skip it because I didn't want to deal with this curved section of wall. And once I decided to add more outlets, I was kind of thinking about how I wanted to do it, whether I was going to use MC cable or maybe use PVC conduit. But I figured before going that route, I could just take a shot at hand bending the EMT conduit. And I basically just pushed on it up against this large curved section of wall. And it's a super shallow radius. And surprisingly, it was actually pretty darn simple. On this first section of bent conduit, I did not do box offsets, which worked. And then on the second section, the last section, I did do box offsets and that also worked. So I'm not really really sure which way is better here, but I figure it's unlikely that you have a big curved wall wherever you're doing your electrical work, but I just figured I'd mention it. But once that conduit was installed and the rest of the boxes were installed, I finished roughing in all of the wiring. And again, I am so happy I went with that color-coded system. It made it super, super simple to keep everything straight. And I think this is gonna be a great system for the whole shop. Once all the rough-in work was done, I could go ahead and make up the outlet boxes. And first I needed to prep some of those outlets I pulled out of the old shop by mounting them in faceplates. 
Again, I use those Wago connectors here. I use the five slot connectors for the ground wire. And then I use the three slot connectors for the hot and neutral, since I had one coming in, one going out, and then the two outlets were tied together with a pigtail. And between these outlets already being pigtailed together and that automatic wire stripper and the Wago connectors, I got these things knocked out in no time. And with that done, I could land all of the wires in the panel. I started by terminating the ground wires on that ground bar I'd installed. And once that was done, I terminated the neutrals on the neutral bar. And then finally, I could connect the two hots to two 20 amp breakers, get them installed in the panel, and then go flip the power back on at the main panel to the sub panel, flip on the sub panel disconnect, and then finally flip on the breakers. And one tip I read in the comments on my mini split install video was to always look away from the breaker when you're flipping them on in case there's a big arc. And that'll just protect you from super bright light or if anything flies out of the panel. And so I did that here, and thankfully there were no arcs. I was pretty confident I wired all this correctly. And once the breakers were flipped, on, I could test the GFCI outlets, both of which function fine. And then I used my little outlet tester to test the GFCI protection on the rest of the outlets on these two circuits. And as expected, they worked great. And with that, I was officially wrapped up with the first circuit installation here in the shop, which is really, really exciting. As I mentioned, I only had two outlets for this whole space before. And now I have one, two, three, four, five, ten sets of outlets here, which is amazing. All right, guys, I think that's where I'm going to wrap up this one. Obviously, I've been hard at work doing a bunch more electrical work, and I've also been working on the drop ceiling installation with the Perkins Builder Brothers crew. So if you guys don't want to miss both of those videos, go ahead and get subscribed and ring the notification bell. As always, I'll have links to all the tools and materials I use down in the video description below. And last, if you want to support me, I sell merch. I have plans available for a lot of my woodworking projects, and I have both Patreon and YouTube members set up. All right, thanks for watching, y'all, and until next week, happy building.